good to see you all. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Vijay sir. Good afternoon, Vivek sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon sir. Hmm. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, a very good afternoon to you all, and I am welcoming you all for the uh, second session of the second day. Uh, and we have uh, speakers, Dr. Madhu, Dr. Shivani, and uh, Dr. Farin, ma'am. Uh, we welcome you all. And the moderators for today's session is Dr. Vijay Mathur and Dr. Vivek Rana. So the session will be on restorative dentistry. And I would like to introduce Dr. Vijay Mathur, sir. So... Dr. Vijay Prakash Mathur is Professor and Head, Department of Periodontics and Preventive Dentistry, Center for Dental Education and Research, All India Institute of Medical Science, Delhi. He is also the President of Indian Society for Dental Traumatology, Honorary Treasurer of Indian Society of Periodontics and Preventive Dentistry, and Vice President of Indian Society for Dental Research, and also the Editor-in-Chief of Journal of South Asian Association of uh, Pediatric Dentistry. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation. And uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Vivek Rana. So Dr. Vivek Rana completed his uh, BDS in 1999 and MDS in 2003 from King George Medical University, Lucknow. His area of academic interest are behavior management, pediatric restorative dentistry, and pediatric endodontics. He has won various awards like best paper in ISPPD conferences 2014, a logo design competition by ISPPD, excellence in research, outstanding contribution in pediatric and preventive dentistry in 2021, and excellence in pediatric and preventive dentistry in 2022. Currently, he is the assistant treasurer of ISPPD and is working as professor in the Department of Pediatric and Preventive Dentistry, Subhati Dental College and Hospital, Meerut, for more than 19 years. So we welcome you all, sir, and uh, we'll move on to today's presentation. So I request Vijay, sir, to introduce Dr. Madhu. Yes, please. So... We would like to welcome Dr. Madhuk Akhanur uh, for this virtual PDO rapid revision 3.0 for year 2022. Uh, today is the day two and the session two. Uh, Dr. Madhu has completed his BDS from uh, Shravasti Dental College, Shimoga, and MDS from Bapuji Dental College, Davangiri. His area of interest are minimal intervention dentistry and special care dentistry. Uh, he has done a lot of presentations and uh, he's been guest lecturer at various programs in Karnataka, Kerala and Andhra Pradesh. He's currently working at Professor and Head of uh, Pediatric and Trinity Dentistry Department in Kaylee's Institute of Dental Sciences in Bengaluru, Karnataka. And his presentation today, the title is GIC Composites and Strip Crowns. Welcome, Dr. Madhu. Thank and you, sir. Thank you so much. Requesting you to start the session. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. This is Dr. Madhu from Kaley Society Institute of Dental Sciences, Bangalore. So my topic of discussion now is glass enoma cements, composite and strip crowns. Just going through the various questions asked in the university examinations in the last 15 years, so composite resins and strip crowns have been asked very rarely and composite as a specific question has never been asked, it has been a part of 
restorative materials in pediatric dentistry or antiregistrative options in pediatric dentistry. Glass cyanomer is a question which is repeatedly asked in the previous question paper regarding from starting from uh, GACS or restorative material in pediatric dental care and its recent advances and uh, uh, basic glass cyanomer cement, critical evaluation of healing potential of glass cyanomers and various parameters used by different investigators. GAC and related cements and their importance in pediatric dentistry and justify GIC as a biomimetic material and resin modified glass animals. So you can see the variety of questions asked on glass animals starting from a 10 marks question to a 100 marks question. And nowadays you don't have this 100 marks questions, maximum it will be 50. And going through the contents, what you have tried is to contains all the contents of these questions under these headings. So, as we know, the glass cyanomer is a generic name of the group of material based on the reaction of silicate glass powder and polyacrylic acid. They call so because setting reaction involves a classic glass and ionic bond. There is a definition which is available in literature given by Wilson Nicholson. They define glass cyanomer as a cement that consists of basic glass and acidic polymer which checks by an acid base reaction between these composites. So this glass cinema cement originally was invented as a powder and liquid formulation by Wilson and Kent and GACs have undergone a number of modifications to improve their mechanical properties and more recently nanofilled resin modified and nanofilled conventional glass cinemas are also developed. So this is a timeline which shows the evolution of glass cinema from basic aspar cement to what it is now. Come to the classifications. You will find various classifications in your textbooks and literature. Just to quote a few, I have put around three classifications which might be important. In the first glass to give at least moderately satisfactory cement was designated G2000 and contained alumina and silica in the appropriate ratio to give a high basicity. It was also high in fluoride. The composition of the first manufactured glass animal cement which was called the G2000 is given in the left side of your screen and in the right side of your screen there are two compositions given of composition A and composition B which are the commercially available glass animals now and the composition A is a widely used composition for powder in the materials what we are using nowadays. This is the uh, function of each, po each powder component. As you know, powder is an acid soluble calcium fluoroaluminosilicate glass, which is also known as ion leachable glass. And these components are fused to a uniform glass by heating them to a temperature of 1100 to 1500 degrees and then cooled and finally powdered to a required size. And for restoration, we use a 50 micrometer, and for luting, we use a 20 micron powder. And there are various modifications of powder and liquid as you know the liquids were aqueous solutions of polyacrylic acid which were too viscous and to reduce the viscosity of these liquids the itaconic malic and tricarbolic acids were added and the tartaric acid is used to improve the handling characteristics it increases the working time and aids in a snapshot of these materials the next important factor in glass cinema is the role of water in its composition. So this water with aging of the cement, the ratio of this tightly bound and loosely bound water increases thereby increasing the strength, modulus of elasticity and decreases the plasticity. And the problem of water loss continues for a longer period for both fast and slow set and precautions must be taken to prevent this dehydration. Early contamination of water in these cements results in a loss of calcium polyacrylate chain, absorption of water, loss of translucency and loss of physical properties leaving the cement susceptible to erosion. And if it is dehydrated, it leads to a cracking and fissuring of cement, softening of surface and loss of matrix forming ions. Skinner described there are two types of water which is found in glass cinema, which may be loosely and tightly bound water and during the initial reaction. Water can be readily removed by desiccation and it is called as loosely bound water. As the setting reaction continues, same water hydrates the matrix and cannot be removed by desiccation and this is called as the tightly bound water. And this hydration is critical in yielding a stable gel and gives a strength to this setting. 
and these are the various modifications in liquid uh, and uh, various dispensing medium with the glass enamel is uh, dispensed. So, coming to the setting reaction, the glass enamel cement is formed by the reaction of three materials, fluoroaluminosilicate, glass powder, an ionic polymer of polyacrylic acid and water. It can be set by a classic acid based reaction or light cure polymerization. McLean has described three steps in the setting reaction of the glass enamel that is under decomposition of the glass and release of cement forming metal ions, migration of these metal ions into aqueous phase of the cement, gelation of the polyacid by the metal ions leading to set. And this is, uh, there is a post set hardening when metal ions become increasingly bound to the polyacid chain and further maturation happens even after 24 hours and a further slow maturation takes place and in the first few days translucency develops further as does the resistance and desiccation and acid and over a period of months the cement becomes more rigid and gathers strength. Fluoride release from glass enamers increases in acidic conditions in addition these cements are able to counteract such acidity increasing the pH of the external medium. This process has been termed buffering and may be clinically beneficial because it may protect the tooth from further tooth decay. And this is an equation which describes the release of fluoride from the glass cyanomer cement. And coming to addition, which is a classical property of a glass cyanomer, it is related basically to ion exchange addition of the tooth structure, bonding to mineralized tissues. This bonding to mineralized tissues where the ions will combine with the surface layer of the cement and form an intermediate layer of the material which is firmly attached to the tooth surface and this is called as diffusion based addition and bonding to collagen. So these are described in these two headings micro mechanical interlocking and true chemical bonding. So as we know these glass enamel cements are naturally bioactive because of the presence of biologically active ions like fluoride, sodium, phosphate and silicate and these are released into the surrounding aqueous medium at levels in which they are biologically beneficial. In acidic conditions, these ions are released in larger quantities than in neutral conditions in addition to calcium and strontium is also released which occurs in relatively insoluble compounds in neutral solutions. Under acidic conditions, glass enamel 2 will reduce the pH of the surrounding storage media and the ions released have a variety of biological roles. And this phosphate occurs in saliva and in balance with the mineral phase of the tooth and silicate become incorporated into hydroxyapatite of the tooth without adversely affecting the crystal geometry. Though whether it can do so with the mineral phase of the teeth under clinical condition is not. Now this calcium is another essential element with many biological causes which is present in the glass enamers and these glass enamers are capable of taking up ions and in natural saliva cements take up calcium and phosphate ions and develop much harder surface. And related to this is the observation that when used as a fissure sealant, glass enamer cements form a substance deep within the fissures that has an increased content of calcium and phosphate and is much more resistant to cutting with a dental drill than the original tooth structure. And this improved resistance to drilling as well as the change in appearance has been claimed to make a residual material resemble the enamel. Coming to the biocompatibility of glass cyanomers, uh, it is defined as ability of a material to perform with an appropriate host response in a specific application. Dahl, Trosen, Meron and co-workers found that freshly mixed glass cyanomer cement were toxic whereas the contradicting results were reported by Kashavara stating that freshly mixed cement inhibited cellular proliferation and it was not cytotoxic. Coming to the effect on pulp cells, Tobias and Platt found that GAC causes greater inflammatory response than zinc oxidational cement but less than zinc phosphate cement and related dental silicate cement which resolves within 30 days and there is no enhancement reparative or secondary dental formation. So the, the, the reaction of pulp to GACs is milder than the composites when the residual dentin thickness is more than 1.5 millimeters, a healthy reparative reaction is seen and uh, thickness from 0.5 to 1 millimeter unhealthy or doubtful reparative changes are seen and less than 0.5 millimeters destructive reaction of pulp dentin organ is seen 
and uh, calcium hydroxide base is recommended over the under the glass enema restorations and the response of gingival tissue towards the glass enema cement in class 5 gametes is very minimal this is a table showing the flexural and compressive strength of various glass enema materials used in the market starting from miracle mix ketac silver ketac molar fusion 9 and fusion 9 extra riva photacolant PG2 LC various uh, resin modified and conventional and light cure glass enamors are also included in this table. Along with its advantages of inherent adhesion to tooth surface, good marginal seal, anti keratogenic property, biocompatibility, and uh, need of a minimal cavity preparation, glass enamor comes with the various disadvantages like low fracture resistance, low wear resistance water sensitive during the setting phase and less aesthetic compared to composite. To overcome all these limitations, there were various modifications done in the glass enamor cement and some of these are listed in this uh, two tables starting from uh, uh, high viscosity glass enamors, metal modified glass enamors, resin modified glass enamors, compomers, self hardening glass enamors and so on. We will just be going through these glass enamor cements in brief. And these glass enamors there uh, have been incorporated with various antimicrobial agents and antibiotics as well to improve its antibacterial and antimicrobial properties. And other than this, natural antibacterial products have also been added to glass enamor like a chloraxinol, boric acid, thymol, chlorexidine in various concentration, citramide, triclosan, benzalpurium chloride, and cetylpyridium chloride to improve the, the antimicrobial properties of glass enamor cements. So in the 1980s with the goal of creating stronger and more durable glass enamor material, one manufacturer added silver amalgam powder to the glass enamor which you call as miracle mix. Now an another combined glass powder with elemental silver which is called as the cement. So both have their own properties and which have been used in the literature. And miracle mix, I think, is still being used in the pop. These resin modified glass armor material that are modified by the inclusion of resin generally to make them more photocurable were introduced in 1988 by Antonio C to overcome the problem associated with conventional glass enamors, which had a low early strength and moisture sensitivity of the traditional glass enamor and had a slow acid base reaction. To overcome these two inherent drawbacks, some polymerizable resin functional groups have been added to glass enamor cements to impart additional curing process and allow the bulk of the material to mature through acid base reaction. These resin modified glass enamor cements are classified based on the curing mechanism. They are dual cure, tri cure, photo cure, and auto cure. Dual cure is by visible light cure, free, rad free radical polymerization, and glass enamor setting that is a classical acid base reaction. And dry cure is by chemical cure of the free radical, polymerization of the composite, and conventional acid based reaction. Photo cure is by visible light only, auto cure is by chemical cure. So, this Activa bioactive kits, which are restorative material, so this elicits a response that stimulates mineral appetite formation and natural mineralization, which is the defining requirement of a bioactive material. This process needs to a restoration and tooth together penetrates and fills micro gaps, reduces sensitivity, guards against secondary caries, and seals margins against micro leakage and failure. Basically, by the nature's way, these are called as the enhanced glass enamors, and they have a synthetic rubber technology which is patented for this kind of restorative materials. These compomers are the polyacid modified composite resins and according to McLean, these are the materials that contain either or both essential components of glass enamor cement but at levels insufficient to promote the acid base during the curing of the material. So they are essentially resin composites with a glass filler and a dehydrated polyacrylic acid. These compomers are a combination of composites and glass enamors. Compared to resin modified glass enamors, they have a limited dual set mechanism. In the dominant setting the reaction in this resin is photopolymerization and no acid base can occur until and later when the material absorbs water. 
So they are available as single phase light curing materials, glass particles are used as fillers in these materials and they are used two different resin matrix system that is a UDMA or a bis -GMA. So this self-hardening glass enamel cements are divided into two chemical types. One is known as a self-hardening material that is it's entirely by neutralization reactions. Second one is a resin modified uh, cement and sets partly by polymerization and partly by neutralization to give slightly tougher material. So these self-hardened glass enamels have been shown to have much better biocompatibility than RMGACs in a variety of situations and Consequently, they have been used for various non-dental applications such as ear, nose, throat surgery and craniofacial reconstructions. Fiber reinforced glass enema cements incorporate alumina fibers or other fibers such as glass fiber, silica fibers and carbon fibers to increase the flexural strength. Geomers are these uh, new class of materials which aims to incorporate the best properties of composite resins and glass enamels. So they are fluoroacrylizing, light cured restorative materials and is tutored as a true hybridization of a glass enamel and composite restorative materials. So they have an advantage of increased aesthetics, ease of handling and improved physical properties of the set material and clinical studies suggest that morphology marginal adaptation and post-operative sensitivity are similar to resin composites and geomers and studies have also found that the secondary caries is less frequent around in geomer restoration. Amalgomer CR is a ceramic reinforced glass enamers which not only complies with the international standards of GAC but also with the standards of amalgam and this ceramic in the amalgam Amalgomer helps in imparting excellent wear and erosion resistance and also enhances the radio opacity and all round strength of the cement. So these are introduced into restorative dentistry to match the strength and durability of amalgam and it contains a high level of fluoride with good aesthetics and it requires only minimal cavity preparation. It bonds to tooth structure and has an excellent biocompatibility. These hyenomers basically incorporate bioactive materials like hydroxyapatite within the glass hyenomer powder. They are mainly being used as bone cements in oral maxillofacial surgery and can be used as retrograde filling materials and they bond directly to bone and affect its growth development. A zirconia has been added in the powder of glass hyenomer cements to increase uh, the strength, toughness, high hardness and corrosion resistance. Now these zirconia components are homogeneously incorporated into the glass component of the powder. This biomaterial promises a outstanding strength, durability and sustained fluoride protection, thus combining and retaining the benefits of both popularly used glass materials like amalgam and conventional glass enamel cement. To increase the strength and hardness of glass enamels, Gu et al. added yttrium stabilized zirconia which is called YSZ into the powder component which has so showed a uh, promising. Nano GAC and cellulose nanocrystals of titanium oxide have also been added to the glass enamel cement which increased the compressive strength by 18.9% and shear bond strength to 150% when tested on an enamel of an extracted tooth. And to, Im to improve the physical properties of these glass enamel cements, amino acids have also been used and studied extensively. And CPP, ACP containing glass enamel cements, Mazzoni et al. found that incorporation of nanoparticles of CPP and ACP into the cross linked matrix of glass enamel caused a 23% increase in compressive strength and 33% increase in micro tensile bond strength. This is one of the uh, restorative material which can be looked at. Antibacterial agents in, like chlorhexidine and uh, hydrosan modified GACs have also been studied. Chlorhexidine has been used in various concentrations and only drawback is that addition of this chlorhexidine digluconate at different concentration interfered with the physical and mechanical properties and still a lot of research is indicated. And 
including this incorporating phytosanin to the GICs has found to increase the micro shear bond strength and studies are still in progress. Polyelectrolytes and triclosan have also been added to the glass and this epigallocatechin 3 gallate have also been incorporated into the glass enamel, which is a promising restorative material. And considering its biocompatibility, this material shows promise not only as a dental restorative material, but also as a bone cement with low cytotoxicity. Ciprofloxacin and metronidazole have also been incorporated in the glass enamel cement, and it affects its effect on a shear bond strength and microleakage are found to be encouraging. This is a Ketak endo applicap and Fuji ortho LC which are currently being used. Calcium aluminate GIC, proline containing GIC, these are the various other glass enamel cements used. And coming to this bioactive glass incorporated GIC, this bioactive glass incorporated GIC improves the bioactivity of the glass enamel which can be observed with the formation of appetite layers especially in the CF9 containing glass enamel cements. This more bioactive glass leads to more bioactivity but decreases the strength. The addition of aluminium to this bioactive glass composition improves strength but decreases the bioactivity. With smaller particle size, they have no effect on bioactivity and they decrease the strength. Still, a lot of research is going on uh, using bioactive glass, incorporating this into the glass enamel cement to improve its uh, physical properties and other properties like remineralization, addition as well. So, these are the various references which you can read for glass enamel cements. Not many references I want to give. So please read DJ Mount. A color, an atlas of glass enamel cement, glass enamel cement in dentistry, a monograph by Sharon B. K. Sidhu, where you will find the varieties of glass enamels and its modifications and its physical and chemical properties. And a recent article, Advances in Glass Enamel Cement, which includes about 35 to 40 various glass enamels, still which are not put it in the put on the slides. Coming to the uh, fissure sealing abilities of glass enamels, low viscosity as well as high viscosity glass enamels have been used for fissure sealing in compromised tooth wherein isolation is a problem, partially erupted tooth and erupted tooth as well. These high viscosity glass enamels have been routinely used in ART technique also. Adva disadvantage with these is the retention rates. The retention rates are comparatively less compared to the uh, resin based fissure sealant. The advantage is the enamel under these fissure sealing glass enamels tend to be more harder than the normal enamel and the caries preventive effect is higher. The recent article in 2018 uh, meta-analysis and a systemic review reported that there is no difference between the percentage of caries development when uh, conventional glass enamels were used as sealants compared to resin-based sealants. Only the retention rates were higher for resin-based sealants but the caries preventive effect, there was no statistical difference. So go through these three articles for uh, uh, glass enamel sealant and its fissure sealing stability. And this is the conference paper which is the guidelines for development of sealant from 2002 to 2014. Next aspect, GIC as a, this term was coined by Otto Smith in uh, 1950s and this is the study of multidisciplinary mechanisms and biologically produced materials to design novel products to mimic nature. And these are the various synonyms for uh, uh, biomimetic materials. And the main principle of biomimetics is to return all prepared dental tissue to full function by a heart tissue bond that allows functional stresses to allow in the entire crown to its final functional biologic and aesthetic result. And the material fabricated by a biomimetic technique based on the natural process found in biological systems is called a biomimetic. Glass enamels are considered natural biomimetic materials wherein by little they show little or no change in dimension when heating or cooling between 20 to 50 degrees centigrade in wet conditions. In dry conditions, these materials showed a marked contraction when heated above 50 degrees. And the explanation for this behavior is that 
the expected expansion on heating is compensated by fluid flow to the surface of the material to cause a balancing of the dimensional changes on cooling the process was reversed in dry conditions the rapid loss of water on heating results in the observed a contraction this behavior is similar to the human dentin and this is called as a man made dentin or a dentin substitute another material which you can use when you are writing about biomimetic biomimetic properties of glass enamel is adhesiveness to glass enamel of two structures and chloride release glass enamel and gac has been used as a uh, biomimetic material in endodontics well and these are the various references for a gac as a biomimetic material and another question which was asked on the healing potential of glass in cement and the various parameters used by investigators so it is discussed under this heading coming to the fluoride ion exchange we know as we know that the glass enamel acts as a fluoride reservoir it keeps the material into a balanced state and at the same time lead to degree of maturation and strengthening of the surface and there is an internal remineralization which happens when the dental pulp demonstrates a very high level of to tolerance to glass enamel and there is very mild inflammatory response initially followed by a rapid recovery over a few days and studies have shown that dental bridging over mechanical exposure is an otherwise healthy pulp in case of using glass enamel in deep and rmgc when used on a in case of ipc and dpc caused an initial mild inflammatory response which is which was stick to the odontoblastic layer and a pulp response of period from none to severely inflammatory to infiltrate and tissue disorganization which varied from normal tissue to pulpal necrosis and reactionary dentin tissue formation varied from being completely absent to intense hard tissue deposition beneath the real wall and these are the various parameters used by the authors in various studies for the self healing properties of uh, glass enamel the histological events the inflammatory cell response reactionary dentin formation cytotoxicity and recording self report from participants and these are the causes of cytotoxicity resin modified glass enamel in the pulp responses were evaluated for these various conditions and there are certain studies which have given varying results about the healing capacity of glass enamel starting from rmgac is not an appropriate material to be used in ipc and dpc till rmgac can be recommended for direct pulp capping in uh, primary tea primary and permanent tea these are the various studies coming to the next material which is composite these composites were uh, have been evolved over a period of time from macrofilled to a nanofilled and hybrid composites right now from a 250 micron size to a 15 to 10 to 14 nanomicron size and these are the various uh, filler contents in this uh, uh, commercially available uh, composite in the market. these are the required characteristics of on polymer based dental composites the physical mechanical biological and practical implications to be used in a as a dental restorative now extensive research is going on in improving the biological characteristics of composite resin like antibacterial and remineralizing capability so considering these biological kinetics restorative dental composites have been synthesized by incorporating various types of antibacterial agents and filler materials so these can be categorized into two main classes ion releasing bioactive filler and non releasing filler to so these ion releasing fillers uh, which are used as antimicrobial agents will degrade the mechanical properties of the composite surface by generating nano pores or internal delamination and sometimes change the shape of the restoration finally the antibacterial ability will gradually decrease and to overcome this drawbacks of ion releasing composites the second type of agent that is a non releasing agent is emerging in the market once the positively charged fillers attract the negatively charged oral bacteria they disturb the structures and function of bacterial cell membrane inducing cell lysis which is described as contact killing mechanism the product studied material studied is a quaternary ammonium compounds 
and to increase the remineralization potential of resin composites monocalcium phosphate dicalcium phosphate or various calcium phosphate materials have been used and this calcium and phosphate ion releasing composites can promote the nucleation and growth of mineral crystals in the protein complex matrix which mimics the natural regeneration of see the bioactive glass has also been incorporated into the composite system to increase their biocompatibility and these are the list of uh, commercial dental compositors in flowable resin nano hybrid composites packable composites and nano hybrid uh, packable composites which are used in the market with their compositions and filler particles and these are the articles which you can refer for uh, a review on uh, composites the dental resin composite or review on materials to product realizations is a very good article please go through that you will find in detail description of what all dental composites and glass enamels or composite resins for primary molars there is a review please go through these two articles and cochrane library review on uh, data on systemic reviews wherein they have discussed about dental filling materials for managing caries resins in primary dentition coming to the last aspect the strip crowns these are a clear plastic strip of cellular acetate used as a matrix band for tooth color restorations and anterior teeth to restore the contour of the anterior teeth so these have the advantage of superior aesthetics so the cost of material is reasonable and the time for placement is also reasonable only disadvantage is it is extremely technique sensitive it is not a durable retentive as stainless steel or open faced stainless steel crown or zirconia crown and adequate moisture control might be difficult on an operative patients although techniques have been well described which can be which we are very familiar and which can write about it in an examination a very little clinical data exists on the longevity of this crown and the procedure is very technique sensitive and any lapses in patient selection moisture and hemorrhage control tooth preparation adhesive application and resin composite placement can lead to failure various resin self curing and light curing resins have been used inside the strip crown to restore an anterior tooth and nowadays Uh, enhanced uh, RMGAC, which is the bioactive, also has been used as a composite inside the strip crowns. The difficulty in application is reflected in a study that only 21% of dental dentists surveyed performed strip crowns compared to 73% of pediatrics. Uh, these are few articles which are discussed about strip crowns. This is an article by Ari Kipitsky, wherein the clinical and radiographic success of bonded resin uh, composite strip crowns in for primary incisions have been discussed and a review on preformed crowns in pediatric dental stain materials 2020 to the latest article wherein they discuss about the all crowns in pediatric dentistry and there's an article recent article which compares the zirconia to anterior strip crowns in primary anterior teeth in children are randomized clinical trials they conclude based on data that teeth covered with zirconia crowns show better gingival health and less bleeding and less plaque accumulation as well as loss of material on the other hand zirconia crowns crowns can cause more loss of opposing tooth structure so this is these are if you please go through these three articles for a literature on strip crowns and along with this i conclude my presentation and i thank the entire ispdd team the office bearers and the ec members for giving me an opportunity to for presenting this lecture and wish you all the best to the exam going post graduates for their future examination thank you thank you sir uh, we will move on to the next presentation by dr shivani and i request the moderator to introduce the speaker you kindly show the slide uh. yes sir yes sir so we'd like to welcome dr shivani for the lecture 2 for this session thank you sir and uh, dr shivani i know of uh, for several years now she is working in its uh, dental college muradnagar Uh, she did her BDS from PGI Rohtak and MDS from DAV Dental College Yamnagar. 
she has area of interest in restricted dentistry, child psychology, behavior management, nitro oxide inhalation, sedation, etc. And she has got several awards. If I speak, we'll take a lot of time, Shivani. I'm yes, sorry. I no, say. no problem, sir. Definitely. Thank you. Acclaimed academicians and uh, she has got more than 60 publications. She has been course faculty, especially on nitrous oxide sedation. And she's a reviewer of many journals. So presenting to you, uh, Dr. Shivani. Thank Most you, sir. Welcome. Stage is yours. A very good afternoon, respected uh, moderators, Dr. Vijay Prakash Mathur sir and Dr. Uh, Vivek Rana sir, and my co-presenters for today's session, Dr. Kareen and Dr. Madhu, and of course, all the participants of uh, the Rapid Revision Summit 3.0. Uh, I'm here to brush up your knowledge on the topic, Stainless Steel Crown. I'm Dr. Shivani Mathu, working as a professor and head in the Department of Pediatric and Preventive Dentistry at ITS Dental College, Muradnagar Gazibar. And I shall be talking about a very, very uh, important topic, not only for the from the theoretical point of view, but also from the clinical point of view, which is stainless steel crowns. So these are a few long questions and short questions and other varied questions which have been asked by various universities over the years uh, on this topic. So, as far as long questions are concerned, they have been in the form of writing detail about the various indications, contraindications, procedure, and modifications of stainless steel crowns with their review of literature, classification of crowns used in pediatric dentistry, and how to do the preparation and crown adaptation for these crowns, discuss the recent advancement in the management of proximal carious lesions in primary teeth, uh, various short questions which have occurred repeatedly is the stainless steel crown itself, uh, preform crowns, false technique, and varied questions like extra coronal restorations, interim restorations for hypomineralized molars, and semi permanent restorations. So, a brief overview of my today's presentation. I shall be covering it under the following headings. Uh, first, a brief introduction, uh, peep into the history, then the classification. Uh, the various steps in the conventional technique of preparation of uh, stainless steel crowns, the modifications, the recent advances, the false technique, and finally the references. So over time, various restorative materials have been introduced in the pediatric industry in an attempt to maintain the prime duty in the arch prior to the eruption of the prominent successes. And one of the most durable amongst these is the stainless steel crowns, which were introduced in 1947 by Rocky Mountain Company and have been used since then in both primary as well as young permanent team. So according to American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, uh, stainless steel crowns are the prefabricated crown forms which can be adapted to prime individual primary molars and cemented in place to provide a definitive restoration. Uh, so this definition needs to be uh, summarized when you're writing an answer on stainless steel crowns. So before uh, starting with the, the, the topic itself, we need to know uh, classification of the full coverage restoration. So it can be an anterior aesthetic or the posterior functional. While the anterior aesthetic restorations include the strip crowns, polycarbonate crowns, zirconia crowns, open-faced stainless steel crowns, the posterior are stainless steel, the prevenial stainless steels, and the zirconia crowns. And today's focus is on stainless steel crowns along with their modifications. So he was a man, Kampi, who after the introduction in 1947 by the Rocky Mountain Company of stainless steel crowns into pediatric dentistry, he recommended the use of these crowns and popularized them. Then again, Mink and Bennett in 1958 re-emphasized the use of these crowns. 1960s, Unitech was a company who came up with new improved quality of the crown. 
And in 1970, Mink and Bennett introduced uh, the methodology of the crown preparation, which is still used till date. In 1977, Mick Avery, uh, they introduced the modifications of stainless steel crowns for space loss cases. So by now, you will be able to answer this viva question. Now coming on to the classification, it's based upon composition, based upon morphology, upon location and occlusion anatomy. So coming on to the classification based upon composition, uh, stainless steel crowns can be available as 18 to 8 uh, authentic type of stainless steel crowns, then the nickel based crowns, the tin based and the aluminum based crowns. While the aluminum and the tin based crowns are not very popular owing to their uh, less strength and less durability, the stainless steel crown per se, uh, they are mainly used uh, available in two forms, that is 18 is to 8 austenitic type, which includes 17 to 19 percent chromium, 10 to 13 percent nickel, 67 percent iron, and 4 percent of other minor elements. While the nickel based crowns, they consist majorly of the nickel, that is 72 percent, chromium 14 percent, iron 6 to 10 percent, and then various minor elements. So, uh, Beesby in 1988, he reported that there is an increased positive crash test in 8 to 12 year olds who received the old formulation of nickel chromium crowns. However, this formulation is not uh, used nowadays. Uh, but uh, a recent study by uh, Sharakuti A, they quoted that the amount of nickel released from stainless steel is less than the number from the other sources. And thus, the immunological reactions to this excess of nickel ions in the bloodstream are normal and does not cause any severe problems. Then again, the next classification which is based upon morphology. The crowns can be uncontoured or untrimmed. They can be detrimmed or pre-contoured. While the uncontoured or the untrimmed crowns are time-consuming since they are neither contoured nor festooned and are longer than the other types of crowns. The pre-trimmed crowns have a relatively shorter adaptation time, but still they are non-contoured, but are festooned. However, the pre-contoured forms require minimal adaptation time since not only they are pre-trimmed, but they are pre-contoured and pre-festooned as well. Again, classification based upon location, it can be either anterior crowns or the posterior crowns. Then we have a classification based upon occlusion anatomy, where various companies have come up with different occlusion forms, uh, and 3M is providing us with uh, the ideal occlusion anatomy amongst these. And these are the various the companies which are providing us stainless steel crowns in India. So now you are able, be able to answer all these viva questions which are frequently asked. Uh, then the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry has quoted that children in high risk exhibiting anterior tooth caries or molar caries may be treated with stainless steel crowns to protect the remaining at-risk tooth surfaces. The children with extensive decay, large lesions or multiple surface lesions in primary molars also should be treated with stainless steel crowns. Those children who require uh, uh, treatment under general anesthesia also should have indications to giving stainless steel crowns. Now, uh, coming on to specific indications for primary molar teeth, they are given after pulp therapy in cases of multi-surface caries lesions, high-risk caries patients where restoration is likely to fail, fractured teeth, teeth with extensive wear, uh, normally going to bruxism, abutment for space maintainers, and correction of single tooth cross bites. For anterior primary teeth, they are mainly indicated as an interim restoration for traumatized teeth or when financial considerations are there, or uh, in cases where the morphology and the occlusion demand the use of stainless steel crowns. A very important indication given by Pinkerton JR is that children who are unlikely to attend regular recall appointments who, or who are unlikely to be reliable preventive patients are two indications of stainless steel crowns. For permanent molar teeth, that is a young permanent molar teeth, these are given in those cases where interim restoration of severely mutilated tooth is required uh, or where cost effectivity is concerned. Uh, in teeth with developmental defects, mainly enamel hypoplasia, MIH, etc., or restoration of a permanent molar which is partially erupted 
or else uh, in young permanent molars following early endodontic treatment where second permanent molar has not yet erupted there are few contraindications as well the patients with a known nickel allergy or sensitivity uh, should not be given uh, stainless steel gums who is unable to cooperate with the treatment any primary tooth approaching exfoliation on the radiograph that is half of the root available and half is off so these are not ideal candidates for stainless steel gum a few advantages and disadvantages of these gums advantages being lifespan is the same as that of the intact primary tooth they provide protection to the residual root st structure the risk of making errors during their application is low and thereby the failure rate is also low the long term cost effectiveness is good and they are modifiable and have a good look while certain disadvantages are they have metallic appearance of course they cannot be used when the tooth is only partially erupted and they cause uh, uh, gingival hypoplasia at times so now you are in position to answer these five based questions in your examinations coming on to the armamentarium uh, we need an aesthetic agent rubber dam diagnostic instruments then few bars and uh, stones uh, important one things number 169l and number 330 uh, per then we have certain pliers we need johnson contouring plier better known as ball and socket plier the crown crimping plier the crown remover the crown and band cutting scissor these are all armamentarium which is required and of course stainless steel crown kit but before starting with the crown preparation we need to select an ideal case and for that we need to consider four important factors one is the patient's behavior management then is the parental motivation and satisfaction towards giving the stainless steel crown the dental age of the patient and preservation of the tooth structure before we start with we need to have a pre operative evaluation as well and for that diagnostic cast are preferable uh, we need to evaluate for a midline canine relation cast to posa relationship bilaterally supra eruption of opposing teeth any nasal ripping of the adjacent tooth also needs to be considered before both before and after the placement of the crown now aims of the tooth preparation we need to completely remove the teeth we need to provide sufficient space to receive stainless steel crown and to have a sufficient tooth structure for crown retention the first step is administration of local anesthesia specifically in those teeth which are whitened This is done to reduce discomfort not only for the tooth preparation but during the placement of rubber dam as well. A bite station is a must. A wax sheet of two millimeter thickness is softened and molded in a horseshoe shape and placed upon the teeth. The patient is asked to bite in said preparation. This method method was advocated by Forrester in 1981. However, we can go ahead with the visual examination and even the use of an explorer. then we need to place a rubber dam it's important not only to protect the surrounding tissues but also to improve visibility and efficiency to better manage the behavior of the patient and to prevent any ingestion there are few modifications which need to be done while placing the rubber dam for stainless steel crown placement first is cutting the rubber dam with the proximally we can use wedges to protect the dam as well as the tissue we need to punch a large hole and then slip it over to the most posterior tooth and definitely to the most anterior tooth in the canine vision as well we need to place wedges also these are devices that we could create rapid separation during the preparation and hence they prevent uh, any damage to the adjacent tooth and how to select size we can use a divider a vernier caliper a bond scotch we can even measure quadrilateral tooth in case the confounding tooth is severely mutilated we can move ahead with the trial and error method and we can also use a standardized size charts for the same so these are various opinions of the authors pertaining to the selection of crowns then there are three main considerations uh, while selecting the crown size that is the mesial distal diameter which i have been told how to assess then the proper occlusion height and finally there should be light resistance to the seating of crowns once the crown size is selected it can be uh, sterilized and then autoclaved so this is an article by kelly et al uh, who uh, documented three steps in the process of uh, sterilization first is the wiping and immersion of stainless steel crown in 3% sodium hypochlorite and subsequently um, 
placing it in ultrasonic inhaler for 15 minutes and then autoclave. Then these are the sizes available. That is, every crown is available in size in the seven, the maxillary and the mandibular, the first and the second lobes. And these are the steps of infiltration. We need to have an occlusal reduction, proximal reduction, the buccal and the lingual reduction followed by finishing. So various authors have uh, documented various uh, uh, occlusal reductions for the uh, placement of before the placement of the stainless steel tongue. These are the proximal reduction specific to which should follow the outer contour of the tooth. We should not be over uh, zealous in preparing uh, the tooth. That is, we, we may land up with either an excessive taper or a shoulder creation, which both of them, these type of operation is not indicated. So which surface to reduce first? Is it the proximal first or the occlusion first? Authors, uh, that is Matthewson, Pinkham, Mink and Bennett have advocated that proximal be reduced first followed by occlusion, while Stewart, Belbury, Forrester and Gobel have indicated the reduction of occlusion first followed by proximal, since occlusion reduction leads to a better visibility of the proximal areas. There are diverse opinions of various authors of the preparation. While occlusion reduction, everybody uh, uh, holds that there should be 1 to 1.5 millimeter of the occlusion reduction as compared to the adjacent tool. Uh, the proximal reduction, in case you are placing a single stainless steel crown, then there should be at least a clearance of 1 millimeter from the adjacent tool. And in case you are placing two adjacent stainless steel crown, there can be a clearance of 2 millimeter from the adjacent tool. Then, regarding the buccal and lingual reduction, some authors document that there should be minimal uh, buccal and lingual reduction and it's done only in cases where there's a large buccal bulge. And this reduction should be around 0.5 to 1.5 millimeter with 45 degree bevel at the occlusion one per room. Coming on to steps of tongue adaptation. We should know what is crimping. Crimping is done for the protection of soft tissues, prevention of leakage of cements, prevention of contamination and adequate retention. This is mainly done in the cervical one part of the crown. Coming on to contouring, it achieves close adaptation to the cemento-namal junction of the crown and it's done in the middle one third. And then comes the crown festoon. It is adapting a crown according to the gingival contour of the tooth. The gingival contour of the second molar, buccal and lingual being smile, and the proximal surfaces being crown lines. While the gingival contour of the mandibular first molar is in the form of a stretched S. So, crown adaptation summary it's trimming, followed by contouring, followed by festooning, and finally the crimping process. There are a few post operative instructions after we place the crown. We need to tell the patient to avoid any kind of heavy chewing with the crown for 24 hours, maintain oral hygiene, avoid sticky diet. And there should be regular recalls after every six months at least. Then to summarize, we need to do the pre-operative occlusion check. We need to have white registration. We need to administer LA, place rubber dam, select the proper size crown, then do the tooth preparation, white registration after the preparation, final adaptation, finishing and polishing, check for the crown fit, radiographically, cement, and then give the post-operative instruction. So Sperry, he has advocated adhering two important principles that will help closely adapt stainless steel crown. The first is the operator must establish the correct occlusal gingival crown height and that the crown margins should be shaped circumferentially to follow the natural contours of the tooth's marginal gingival. So these are various uh, recommendations from authors uh, as far as crown finishing is concerned. We need to have a feather edge green stone is uh, uh, used to finish and finally ultimately it's polished through a rubber weave. The crown is seated from lingual to buckle and in doing so there should be a friction felt and a snap sound. Uh, gingival blanching is observed in case the crown margins are long so we need to trim the crown again. If the crown does not seed that indicates that either there is an inadequate or mutual reduction or an proximal edge or else the contact has not been broken properly. So we need to check the conformation of the gingival fit by taking the radar. So these are the st various steps of cementic crown. After isolating, we need to mix the um, cement and then place it covering two thirds of the crown uh, dimensions. 
and then ask the patient to buy it and excess syringes removed. These are again the recommendations by different authors, which we need to remember. Uh, specifically, before replacing a stainless steel crown over a vital tooth, we need to apply a cavity varnish. And the cements commonly used are reinforced zinc oxide eugenol, polycarboxylate, and glass ionizing cements. And of course, for the non vital teeth, we have zinc phosphate cements. So now you'll be very much in a uh, position to answer all these viable questions. Kindly go to them and search out elaborate answers for these. Um, questions. There are various clinical and radiographic success criteria which have been documented by various authors over time. So this is the criteria for clinical success and these are the various major and minor uh, uh, failures which have been documented in this article. So please go through these articles. Coming on to the modifications of stainless steel crowns. In 1971, Mink and Hill reported several ways of modification of stainless steel crowns, and we'll be covering these one by one. So, in case there's an oversized crown, we need to dry the crown first, curl either on the buckle or the lingual surface, pinch the crown to reduce the size, and then adapt the crown and finally sim. In case the crown size is undersized, we need to again check for the crown size, and we need to again give a lick either buckly or lingually, adapt the band. Weld it and then cement it. In case we have open contacts, a larger size crown be selected and there should be an exaggerated in the proximal country. Now, there are a few modifications uh, in the placement of crown. So, uh, in, in case there is a crown, uh, so in, in cases where there are adjacent stainless steel crowns with arch length laws, uh, there's a loss of mesodistal dimension. So, additional reduction be done on the proximal surfaces and the smaller size crowns are preferred. In case a crown is need to be placed before the eruption of coherent molar, we need to take care of the space for the uh, needed for the eruption of the permanent molar. Then, in cases where there are multiple crowns in the same arch need to be given, we need to place the distal crown first, followed by the mesial crown. In case the crown margin need to be extended subgingivally, we can uh, attach a piece of metal uh, that is a band material and weld or sold into the crown. This is another modification that is open face stainless steel crown as suggested by Lincoln Hill in 1973, uh, where uh, the stainless steel crown is adapted over the anteriors and the labial window cut and composite veneering is done on the labial aspect to restore the aesthetics of the crown. The advantages being they are fairly aesthetic they are very durable and retentive. The material is fairly inexpensive. However, the disadvantages are longer time for placement is required. And the placement of composite facing may be compromised when gingival hemorrhage is there. Restoration of hypoplastic teeth, a layer of solder from the impression surface of crown can be added. This is a study pertaining to the same. And in cases of bruxism also, crown suggests crawl or suggested a technique where a layer of solder, again, is uh, uh, um, attached from the impression surface of the crown, which can be uh, placed over to prevent any uh, wear through the occlusal surfaces of the stainless steel crown. So now we are in a position again to answer to this ba uh, basic wire-based questions. Now coming on to the clinical complications, aspiration and ingestion interproximal ledge, poor margins, and crown tilt. So interproximal ledge is mainly attributed to the incorrect angulation of the tapered fissure bed. And how to prevent it? We can extend the proximal slice below the gingival crest. Again, crown tilt is mainly owing to the deficient lingual and buckingal or the improper use of pearls. So in that case, we need to have an optimum uh, buildup, core buildup prior to the placement of the crown. In case of poor margins, so it is mainly due to the improper uh, adapt it leads to improper adaptation of the crown. So we need to keep the margins pipette to the greatest diameter and recrimp and open the margins in this case. Uh, accidental ingestion and aspiration of foreign bodies can occur, and this article by R. K. Adam et al. Uh, tells us and summarizes that what could be done in both situations. So keep the patient in a reclined position. In case if an object is found in the oral cavity, we may uh, remove it. In case it's not found, then we need to monitor it. 
through the chest seat uh, nasal uh, gas and maybe an endoscopy and may refer the case to a gastroenterologist in case uh, if this if the airway obstruction is noted we need to uh, perform hemorrhage manual and at immediately uh, call in medical emergency team so these are the biva based questions pertaining to what we have discussed till now a few recent advances the company has added a uh, a ring on the label aspect for the attachment of the dental floss preventing uh, children from swallowing or chewing the crown during the application and ultimately this ring can be attached by a foam plier another uh, is the aesthetic the pleasing uh, golden colored crowns where which are coated with golden titanium and these are these can be uh, used hand in hand with the normal stainless steel crowns so these are some key articles uh, pertaining to the long term success of the stainless steel crowns you may go through them and quote them in your answers these are again this is again a stainless steel crown related success rate article 10 year survival rate where it's found to be 79% in comparison with other restorative materials then clinical efficacy of various luting cements pertaining to stainless steel crowns then we have other articles Uh, of stainless steel crown used after pulp therapy, and then impact of stainless steel crowns on the gingival health. So you may put these um, studies in your answer guide. These are comparison of the stainless steel crown versus zirconia stainless steel crown can also be used as a preventive measure, and this technique of crown placement is called as a Hall's technique. So Hall, Dr. Norna Hall. Uh, documented this technique where uh, the stainless steel crown is used to manage caries binding over the teeth by seating a correctly sized crown over the tooth and sealing the caries region using a glass annular seal so there's no need of preparation no la no caries removal and it's quick and non invasive however a careful case selection is needed a high level of clinical expertise and excellent patient management is a must So before after placing the orthodontic separators, we select the proper size crown. Try to adjust and modify it, and finally, cementation of the crown is done. So these are articles of uh, the success of Hall's technique, long term clinical trials, and uh, these are two articles quoting how does the occlusion settle after placing the uh, stainless steel crown through Hall's technique. So this is an article by Joseph et al. who uh, which tells. that any changes in occlusion following the placement of crown by hall technique settles in 4 weeks the occlusion vertical dimension settles in 3 weeks post placement as compensated by the inclusion of the stored tooth and its antagonist re eruption of the other tooth teeth in the arch or a combination of both another article by nayar et al quotes uh, that correction of occlusion occurs by rapid eruption of the other teeth in 15 to 30 days post placement of the stainless steel crown now these are few biva based questions again this is a success, uh, study where first technique has been compared to other conventional techniques for restoration uh, indications of all technique in any class 1 class 2 lesions cavitated or non cavitated while the contraindications include irreversible pulpal involvement insufficient sound to show left to retain the crown patient cooperation where the clinician cannot be confident that the crown can be fitted without endangering the patient patient's airway or uh, a patient at risk from bacterial endocarditis or a parent or child unhappy with the aesthetics advantages include quick and non invasive no preparation needed no airway no rubber dam acceptable to the dentist parent and the child while the disadvantages include untreated caries may cause pulpal pathology and retreatment is difficult now these are again certain biva based questions go through them search for the answers in detail and you will get to know much so these are my references but i would like to tell in them that books definitely are the plane the train and the road and they are the destination and they are the journey and they are the home so you need to go through the books definitely just going through the notes or the ppts is not enough you do have this habit of reading books and you will gain a lot thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for patient listening i wish you all the best for your exams
and you can call contact me uh, for any queries on this email id in case of any questions any queries of yours and i would like to thank my post graduates uh, for for uh, making me help compile this presentation and uh, definitely i would like to acknowledge and thank uh, indian society of pediatric pediatrics and preventive dentistry for giving me this opportunity to speak on this topic thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Shivani. Sir, Vivek, sir, can we introduce the next speaker? Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Without any further delay, I would like to introduce the third speaker of the day, Dr. Farin Kartge. Dr. Farin Kartge, sir, please. Uh, uh, yes, sir. We are sharing the screen. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Dr. Farid Kartge had completed her BDS from Government Dental College, Mumbai, and MDS from Annamala University. She is currently working as professor and head in Tender Dental College, Narul, Navi, Mumbai. She has more than 75 publications in national and international journals. She, she is an astute clinician with an exclusive pediatric denti uh, dentistry practice in Mumbai since 20, 20 years. Her topic of presentation is zirconia and newer crowns in pediatric dentistry. Welcome, Dr. Farid. Welcome, Dr. Farin. Now you can start your presentation. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So we are playing that presentation. Just give us a second. You will play it, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We are playing. Okay. Good day to all. This is Dr. Farin Kadge presenting to you in virtual pedo rapid revision. The topic for today's presentation is zirconia and newer crowns in pediatric dentistry. The university questions generally asked are crowns for primary anterior teeth, treatment modalities for restoring grossly decayed primary teeth, restorative alternatives for rehabilitation of carious primary posterior teeth or anterior teeth, modern aesthetic restorative materials, or place of modern aesthetic restorative, den restorative in pediatric dentistry. This is Terna Dental College where I come from. These are the contents of my presentation. Zirconia was used in adult dentistry for many years and it was introduced in pediatric dentistry only since 2012. So therefore, we have only about 10 years since these crowns are available and therefore, there are limited amount of studies as per use of zirconia crowns in pediatric dentistry. Zirconia is used as a biomaterial since 1970s. It is a white crystalline oxide of zirconium. And to this is added yttrium oxide, which results in a stabilized core ceramic referred to as the trim stabilized zirconia. Yttria stabilized zirconia has a small grain size, low porosity, transformation toughening, which leads to excellent mechanical properties. These are some of the physical properties of the material with a compressive strength of 400 to 900 megapascals, which is needed for crowns to be used in posterior teeth. High fracture resistant, good chemical resistance and wear resistance, excellent frictional behavior is other properties when zirconium oxide is combined with yttrium oxide. These are the biting load which zirconia has good biocompatibility no systemic toxic effects. It is seen that inflammation adjacent to zirconia is satisfactory and bacteria and pathogens seem to adhere to zirconia to the same extent as other materials. 
we are seeing that adults are becoming more aware of their own teeth. And also parents seem to rank attractiveness to health. Therefore, there is an increased demand of aesthetic crowns and aesthetic restorative materials for children, not only for anterior, but even for posterior teeth. This is the intraoral decay pattern that we are seeing these days for early childhood caries. Maxillary incisors are involved, mandibular may or may not be involved, and posteriorly you may have from first molar, second molars, maxillary or mandibular involved, which leads to aesthetic problems, speech disturbances, psychologic problems, reduced self-esteem, and decreased mas masticatory efficacy. American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry says it is necessary to treat and what the appropriate material and techniques are for restorative dentistry in children and adolescents. APD has given these guidelines for all the material available and it is for us to use our clinical judgment and the investigations and decide what is the best material or restorative plan for each tooth and each child. Crowns that are available, what do they do? They give us coverage, retention, occlusion, are good in wear and tear, restore natural contour and aesthetics. The indications of preformed crowns are teeth with extensive caries, cervical decalcification, failure when other restorative materials don't stay, pulpotomy and pulpectomy post-restoration, restoring a tooth that can be used for an abutment, intermediate restorative material, definite restorative treatment for high caries risk, and for treatment performed in general, anesthesia or sedation. There are many brands of crowns, aesthetic crowns that are available for pediatric dentistry. As we know, in pediatric dentistry, the crowns that are used are preformed crowns. There is a high demand of aesthetic crowns for children these days in anterior and in posterior teeth. The new age crowns that are available are zirconia crowns and figaro crowns. A little later, I will discuss Figaro crowns, and there are studies which have shown that Figaro crowns have not been very effective as far as children are concerned or as durable as the zirconia crowns. The zirconia crowns available today are Kinder crowns, New Smile crowns, Easy Pedo crowns, Chen crowns, Kids E Dental zirconia crowns, and Signature crowns. The advantages are of zirconia crowns, they are aesthetically pleasing, natural appearance, highest strength, fracture resistance, biocompatible, color stable. The disadvantages are their inability to crimp, prepare, you have to prepare the tooth to fit the crown rather than fitting the crown to the tooth. You cannot use zirconia crowns as a snap fit. It has to be a loose fit because of which you have to also rely on the looting cement for retention. There has been seen a lot of wear of the opposing natural tooth. There's a longer preparation, cutting time, a little bit more technique sensitive for the practitioners and relatively expensive. Once the crown cutting is done, you can start by selection of a crown. This is an additional step in zirconia crown as compared to stainless steel crowns. So you can have a try and crown, which you use this to select the crown that will appropriately fit, after which you go back to the crown box and take the appropriate crown that is selected and use it for that particular tooth. It is recommended to autoclave zirconia crowns. Prior to autoclaving, you may use an ultrasonic cycle with alcohol. Which type 
of looting cement do you recommend? There is GIC, there's resin modified cement, calcium alumin aluminate cements, and bioresponsive ionic resin cements are recommended. Glass ionomer cements bond with the tooth, but unless significant internal retention has developed on the interior of the crowns, these cements are not ideally recommended for zirconia. Resin modified cements, RMGIC, they provide an iconic bond to the tooth structure. They are recommended for zirconia crowns. They prevent dissolution of glass ionomer from interior of the crown and bond to receptors of the interior crown, which is an added advantage and helps well for the retention of zirconia crowns. Calcium aluminate cements are available, which form a mechanical bound to the zirconia via the deposition of ketoide crystals and gypside gel matrix. With excess of calcium in formulation, it also releases calcium during and after cementation. Bioresponsive ionic resin cements are biocompatible. These form hydroxyapatite forms at the cement tooth interface via a reaction between calcium and phosphate in the cement's formulation. They offer three methods of cure, self-cure and photocure resin component and self-cure bioresponsive ion ionoma component. Normally, cements adhere to zirconia. It is seen very often that there is contamination of the zirconia crown. Blood and saliva contains phosphates. And if the phosphates in blood and saliva come in contact to zirconia prior to cementum, then the phosphate is taken up by the zirconia crowns. Therefore, before cementation, it is very essential that you clean the zirconia crowns. In order to clean the zirconia crown, either you may clean it with your regular water or saline, or you may use a specially paste like Ivo Clean Cleaning Paste. The next point is after selection of zirconia crown, it is advisable not to touch a zirconia crown. It is very difficult and not recommended to adjust the zirconia crown. Now we will discuss some studies for the use of zirconia crowns in our clinical practice. So this is a study of influence of looting cement on the clinical outcomes. So it has shown that posterior zirconia pediac crowns have high fracture resistance after 36 months of clinical performance, irrespective of looting cement. Looting cement for zirconia pediatric crowns has no apparent effect on gingival condition around crowns. This is another good study which discusses micro leakage of cements in prefabricated zirconia crowns. In vitro factor fracture resistance of three commercially available zirconia crowns are discussed in this uh, article. The conclusion being that statistical significant differences were found amongst the forces required to fracture zirconia crowns made by three different manufacturers. Another important point that one needs to discuss is the wear of the opposing enamel. Another good article which discusses quantitative and qualitative assessment of wear of primary enamel against three types of full crown coverages. Zirconia crowns induce the most severe wear in primary molars, followed by stainless steel crowns, and the least wear was in induced by prevenial stainless steel crowns. Here, I would like to discuss that whenever we are discussing preformed uh, pre crowns for children, the gold standard will always remain stainless steel crowns. After stainless steel crown, what came next were prevenial stainless steel crowns. That means stainless steel crowns were preveneared with the resin. They were available in anterior and posterior. But as they were being used, it was observed that with a lot of masticatory forces of posterior teeth, the preveneared crowns showed that the veneers normally came off. 
Therefore, the pre vineyard crowns did not, were not used much, which then led in 2012 to the introduction of zirconia crowns. And then till now, we are using zirconia crowns wherever aesthetic is a requirement. So therefore, zirconia preformed crowns are used in children for primary teeth, not only in anterior, but even in posterior teeth. Another article discusses in vitro evaluation of wear of primary tooth enamel against different ceramic and composite resin materials. This article says that zirconia causes lesser antagonistic tooth wear than lithium silicate that is present in some composite resins. Hence, they recommend that zirconia can be used for full coronal coverage restorations in primary teeth. Retention, clinical and radiographic success, another good article which you can go through to see a long-term follow-up of 6, 12 to 18 months. Clinical success as compared to strip crowns and previous genius crowns, another randomized control trial of three aesthetic full crown restorations in primary maxillary teeth. Another article by Daniel Holsinger, Martha Wells, which says clinical evaluation and parental satisfaction with pediatric zirconia anterior crowns. They conclude that zirconia crowns are clinically acceptable restorations in prim primary maxillary anterior dentition and parental satisfaction with zirconia crowns is high. Another article which says, which compares parental sat satisfaction with three tooth colored full crown coronal restorations in primary maxillary incisors. Which brings us to a systematic review, which, which is for the use of restorative full crowns made with zirconia in children. You could go through these articles because when you write a pay answer, there are some articles that you need to quote while answering in a theory paper of your MDS theory exam. Another article, interesting article is zirconia crowns for rehabilitation of decayed primary incisors and aesthetic alternative. Now we will discuss a few articles for comparison of zirconia with preform metal and the gold standard stainless steel crowns. This is an article of, of, which discusses preformed pediatric zirconia crowns versus metal crown, which is a randomized control trial. Another article which discusses clinical evaluation between zirconia crowns and stainless steel crowns in primary teeth. This article concludes that both stainless steel and zirconia crown present an excellent choice for posterior teeth restorations. However, they conclude that zirconia crowns perform better regarding gingival response to material of restoration and plaque retention despite its high cost. The other preform aesthetic crowns that we have are Figaro crowns and Bioflex crowns, which are recently going to be introduced by Newsmite. Figaro crowns are preformed crowns. They're all white, metal-free, bisphenol A-free crowns made in USA, approved. They are less technique sensitive because they do not need as much cutting as the Cunha crowns. The, the flex fit technology helps for a better fit and you don't have to wait long for the cement to set. The next crowns are new smile flex crowns. They are not yet introduced. They are about to be introduced, which are more flexible and provide a, and promise a better fit as compared to zirconia crowns. They are all white, metal-free, biocompatible material, flexible, durable, and the most important criteria is trimmable with natural aesthetics, since they are just about to be introduced. So therefore we do not have much studies. Once the use is started and the studies are there, then we can know about the performance of these crowns. 
comparison of zirconia crowns with preformed aesthetic crowns. This is an eight month prospective randomized clinical trial com comparing zirconia crowns with glass reinforced fiber composite crowns, which are the Figaro crowns. And this study concluded that primary molar zirconia crowns had high acceptable and significantly better clinical performance than glass fiber reinforced composite crowns after 18 months. Now to go into a tooth preparation of zirconia crowns. The reason I have included this in the presentation is because there may be a question which says, give the step-by-step -step, uh, use of zirconia crowns in a child. We will discuss the anterior presentation first. So this is the, the preparation will be similar to what we do in stainless steel crown. The only difference is the amount of cutting is much more extensive in zirconia crown. That is the first point. And the second point is when you are doing a preparation for a zirconia crown, a subgingival preparation of 0.5 to 1 mm is definitely needed. So the crown preparation, you begin with incisal, you do an extensive mesial and distal preparation, after which you have to do a subgingival preparation. That since the cutting is very extensive, which is three to four mm of each side, it is very essential that the root canal preparation should be done. Use of zirconia crowns for anterior or posterior primary teeth without doing pulpotomy or pulpectomy can be very difficult. You can do it in case of the teeth are hypoplastic or discolored, but you have to use your clinical judgment to see that you are not close to the pulp after the preparation is done. It is very important that when you are doing anterior preparation, there should not be over zealous cutting and an over tapered presentation should not happen. Then we come to zirconia crowns for posterior teeth. So these are the steps for preparation, whether you do it for anterior teeth or posterior teeth. First, you'd select a crown size by using either a trine or you use a crown from your crown box. Then you do occlusal reduction, interproximal reduction. In zirconia crowns, a buccal and lingual reduction is absolutely essential as against stainless steel crown where it, it may or may not be done. The subgingival reduction step has to be done. That is followed by a very important step of rinsing and cleaning the crown and the tooth preparation as there is a lot of bleeding due to subgingival reduction. After the crown is clean, dried, a cementation is done, preferably with a resin modified GIC cement, looting cement. So this is the crown selection, either with a trine or with one of the crowns from the crown box. This is the set of crown burrs that may be used. You begin with occlusal reduction. There has to be adequate amount of reduction with absolute good clearance between the maxillary and the mandibular teeth. This is the preparation as we see. Then you begin with the proximal reduction. Mesial and distal reduction has to be done of two to three millimeters. Then you do two to three millimeters of buccal and lingual reduction. This is the subgingival preparation that is done. 0.5 to 1 mm of subgingival reduction has to be done. This is after the preparation. After cleaning, the crown is done and cemented. So what is the summary? When we are doing a selection for a tooth, for an anterior or a posterior, the reason zirconia crowns is done when aesthetics is the demand. If aesthetics is not a requirement in posteriors, till today, 
the gold standard would be a stainless steel crown. So when you select a crown, you have to decide what is most durable, is aesthetics a demand, which is most conservative, cost effective, least technique sensitive, and which is the best, best to restore that particular tooth. So the reason for use for zirconia crowns is mainly the aesthetic demand. What is the main disadvantage of zirconia crown is the increased amount of cutting that you have to do in case of putting a zirconia crown. That is the first one. The second one is it is a loose fit, not a snap fit. Therefore, the retention is very uh, dependent on the looting cement. Maybe the crowns may come out. And the third is contamination that takes place because of either saliva or blood because of which the crowns may fracture. Therefore, your final outcome is decided for zirconia crown is used because of aesthetic demand. Age of child and behavior management will definitely pay, play a factor. And of course, the cost of treatment is increased because of use of zirconia crowns, which I would say is relative depending on the requirement and need of the patient. These are my references. Thank you very much. A big thank you to ISPPD for giving me this opportunity uh, to present uh, in rapid revision. A big thank you to Dr. Nikhil Srivastav, sir, and Sharat Ashokan for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fareen, for wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Fareen, for wonderful thank presentation. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I think there's some problem with the network, so. Uh, there are some questions uh, asked, sir. Can, uh, do you want me to read it out, sir, or the moderators? You want me to read it out, sir? Jay, sir? Dr. Sharat, uh, questions only for Dr. Shivani. It's related to stainless steel crowns. Yes. There, yes there are I think questions. one for Dr. Madhu, sir, is also there. Uh, this is last question. Uh, so I will start. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Uh, Dr. Shivani, this question is for you. Achha, Dr. Madhu. Dr. Madhu, this question is for you. Which material to be used as a sealant for primary teeth? Sir, I, didn't, I think I just projected a Cochrane database of reviews in 2018 by Dr. Priyadarshi. So titling the sealants for preventive dental care is in primary teeth. That you clearly stated uh, the resin based sealants, which are more effective in primary dentist, especially the fourth generation resin based sealants, which are fluoride releasing. But in cases of a partially erupted tooth where uh, uh, contamination is a problem and isolation is a problem, then glass enamel sealants are advised. Glass enamel sealants advantage they have a fluoride release and retention is less when compared to uh, resin sealants. And other sealants which are being tried now is the geomers and uh, compomers. Geomers and compomers are, have the advantage of fluoride release. The only problem is they don't have a longer literature. The follow-up is very less. So considering the present scenario, the three types of sealants which can be used effectively in primary teeth are the fourth generation resin sealants, glass enomer, high viscosity and low viscosity sealants, geomers and compomers. I asked them to please go through the Cochrane database used in 2018 for sealants in primary teeth for prevention of dental cases. Uh, Dr. Shivani wants to be made co-host. I think Madam is not there. Thank you, Dr. Madhu. Uh, next question for yes, Dr. Sir. Shivani. Dr. Shivani is not there. No, she's, she's here, just... ma'am. I think she, ah, she, said she had to go back. So yeah, okay, okay. Dr. Shivani, please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, I'm not able to switch on my video, perhaps. I don't know. Okay, but uh, I'll you, be you can to... now. You... No, you can actually. You can actually. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Dr. Shwani, the question is, what crown can be given for partially erupted teeth? Okay. So, for partially erupted teeth, uh, there are two situations, basically. Uh, when in cases of molar incisor hypomineralization, or maybe in cases of uh, pre-eruptive caries, sometimes uh, due to hypersensitivity, 
uh, we may be needing the placement of stainless steel crowns because there is no other restoration which may be able to uh, re uh, retain there. So in those cases, we may move ahead with the, maybe an opopolectomy or maybe a certain sort of um, crown lengthening before placement of the stainless steel crown. So uh, there's an article by Sharma et al. in 2012, which says that crown lengthening can be done um, before the placement of the stainless steel crowns in case the teeth are partially erupted. So we can go ahead with them or else uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, and we may check uh, the fit of the crown radiographically and then we may recall the patient after say about every uh, month to check in for the uh, retention of the crown. I hope that uh, answers the query. Yes, Some... uh, yes, I can. I can hear you. Yes, sir. Can you so, hear me? Yes. Yeah. Any other questions, sir? Uh, second yeah, question. We had two questions on YouTube as well. Uh, I think it's a million dollar question which has never been answered. Any answers from you? Why does the crown number start from two and not from zero or one? So I'm not able the to box. get the question, sir. The, the crown box. The crown? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Now this is that usual billion dollar question which doesn't have an answer. Maybe you can share it with us. So why does the crown box not start with zero or one? And why does it start from two to seven? Uh, crown sizes, I... right? The crown, the crown size. Yes, sir. The crown sizes start from two. Not two from... to seven, two to seven, and why not zero and one? Sir, this is a question I really no. need to get the answer. So maybe Vijay no, sir, right from my postgraduate days, it's still a million dollar question which has never been answered. So if anybody can give us some yeah. answer, it'll be good, I think. But it was asked in the YouTube, so, Sharad, some one of the postgraduate. Sharad, yes, yes, Sharad, will you give me million? Yes, sir, Vijay dollars? sir. <laughs> so, sir, you, 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 waiting, we're waiting for that. I think there's an echo from my computer. I'm just going to other room. Just to, just one moment. Yes. Actually, we can hear you, sir. I'll just answer. You are the treasurer and you can take the million dollars from ISP. Please. <laughs> so uh, I talked the same question to the inventor, uh, 3M company. There was a lady called Dr. Sumitra. Uh, Dr. Sumitra has got almost uh, 3,000 patents on her name on different materials. And I happened to meet her in year 2007 in Sri Lanka in one of the conference. And uh, she said that they make for the customers. They make the kits for the customers. The number of people using zero and one sizes are so less that it is not financially viable for them to make a kit and sell, uh, to put it into the kit and sell. So once upon a time, they used to make the crowns on order. Then they started manufacturing a small amount, but online order, it was available. And very recently when I needed for someone, I did not get it because they do not supply it in India. And we, we come under the uh, their Singapore office and the Singapore office has stopped ordering since 2016 uh, any zero and one number crowns. So the Singapore division uh, is not supplying. We do not get it now. But yes, in, if you are sitting in US, if you put an online order, within four days, you get it. Sharad, I'm waiting for your million dollar check. Sir, it's coming from my SPPD, sir. Russia will send it, sir. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for that information, sir. Thank you Thank so you much. That, uh, Thank you. Interesting piece of information. I'm sure everybody would have got something out of that. Sir, I think the other question was regarding the bite registration. Uh, other yeah, methods yeah. of uh, checking yeah. with the bite registration. Uh, one I've mentioned regarding the uh, moving of a probe um, in between the upper and the lower teeth. And the second one uh, has been mentioned as uh, uh, the visual examination. We can also check it visually. Otherwise, we can always uh, check it through a P, uh, this thing, your silicon material, your putty also, that can also be used. And uh, there's an article by Pani et al. 
which also tells you uh, how to check occlusion for the stainless steel crown in cases of taking when you're taking up cases under general anesthesia as well. So it's a very good article. Uh, a customized tray is formed where the flanges are cut and then the putty is placed into it. You take the bite and then after cutting, doing crown cutting, you again check for the bite. So this is how you go about. Then, uh, Next question is, uh, what are the radiographic assessment after placement of crown? Doctor, yes, sir. So again, I have another solution. I think Vijay sir wants to add something. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Vivek, I have some simpler solution for uh, what we were talking about, the crown cutting, uh, the clearance. So uh, one of some, some of the company, local manufacturers have come out with this kind of thing. It's a box with four different strips, plastic strips. These have got variable thickness of the strip, 0.5 mm, 1 mm, 1.5 and, and 2 mm. So this is somebody uh, in Prosto they have been using for interocclusal clearance. So ask the patient to bite on this and, and then you pull it out. If you can pull it out, that means this much of clearance is there. So start from the lowest size, go to higher size. You will able to, you'll be able to detect how much is the clearance between the teeth. So this is very simple, a rubber sheet. There's nothing, only thickness is variable. And one side it is thin and one side it is little thick. Uh, this is for permanent teeth and this is for the primary teeth. Very simple uh, thing to use uh, for the teachers to use it in the exam time. Uh, or uh, while teaching the students, you can use that. Uh, there's, there's nothing. See, I'm showing you a product of a company, but this anyone else of us can make it. It's just a rubber. You just buy variable uh, sheet uh, rubber from somewhere and cut and use it. Is that fine? Was that tip usable? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so very helpful. Very helpful and very effective. And very practical too, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. Because yes. so we need something for children which we can use easily and which is not long and tedious. Absolutely. That is very important for them. Even taking wax bites sometimes gets so difficult. Well. We will be having MBS exam now. So this is also important for them for checking also. So regarding the radiographic assessment, uh, I had already put in, quoted an article in my presentation by uh, Shanzis et al. that uh, tells a varied my, minor and major criteria of uh, major failures of the crown. So it is pertaining to the marginal adaptation of the crown, the proximal contact also. Any GIC which has overflown uh, while cementation of the crown can also be checked radiographically. There's a criteria for assessment of that too. And there is another criteria for the rate of alveolar bone resorption. So these are the various radiographic criteria which can be evaluated over a period of time. So this, uh, this is an article which you can quote in your exams. It will be very, very beneficial. I hope I have been able to answer this question. So then, uh, then there was another question regarding active eruption. Uh, in situations of active eruption, uh, we can do two kinds of modifications. Firstly, as suggested by Nash et al., uh, when we are placing a crown over the primary second molar. So we can either over trim the crown, that, that is a tooth structure distally, or we may compress the stainless steel crown distally by a hoe plier that will make space for the eruption of the permanent first molar. And uh, we can, uh, uh, we need to have a thorough radiographic examination while doing so and keep the patient on follow-up again. And uh, in case uh, of, if you're talking about the eruption part of the permanent first molar, so if you're placing a crown during that time, then also you can, since you'll be short of the crown margins, you can either place or adapt a band material over it and mis-cement it to prevent any loss of the cement material uh, through that area. Uh, Dr. Shivani, what, uh, another question, what is mini crimping and micro crimping? Yes, sir. Hello? Uh, mini crimping and micro crimping. 
Can you hear me? Question on mini crum. Mini crum. Can you hear me? The question is on mini crum. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Mini and micro. Please open the chat box. Uh, question and answer chat box. Please open. Mini crimping and micro crimping. Yes, article by T. P. Crawl. It's on mini crimp. You have a heatless green stone which we rotate at a reverse. Uh, this thing it runs in an anti-clockwise direction. So if you run it at forty-five degree angulation, then it creates a crimp, right? The the you usually use a crimping plier instead of running a crimping plier. We just use the trimming using a heatless green stone with a forty-five degree angulation, so that it helps in formation of that crimp. It was given in an article, a two-page article by T.P. Crawl, which you can add. Uh, Dr. Shivani, are you back, sir? Can you hear that? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. But there was a question on mini crimp, so we were just answering that for okay. from the article okay, from T.P. Crawl. Okay, sir. Yeah, but there's, really there's one more question. Why is the distance placed first and not the uh, mesial? The two back-to-back crowns. Is the so, distal crown placed first? And so uh, a distal crown is mainly placed first because in case the mesial crown is placed first, then uh, there is a, a flow of the cement in the interproximal area, and we may not be able to clear uh, the interproximal area for okay. cementation of the E will not be very. Um, uh clear we will not be able to see it properly the second is that in case we are uh, moving ahead with the cementation of the uh, anterior tooth first then again due to the flow of the cement we may have uh, problems with the cementation or the placement of the crown in relation to e so in in that case we need to have a cementation of the e first and then the d that is the distal tooth first and then the uh, proximal tooth I hope I am able to answer this correctly. Yes, 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 sir. Vijay sir, I think they want to pay you one more million dollar. Somebody, one anonymous attendee is asking a question on polycarbonate crowns. So they want to know the numbering on polycarbonate crowns. So do you have any answer for that, Vijay sir? So polycarbonate crowns are mostly they they are uh, they numbered based on the width. And as we know that there is a ratio proportion, golden ratio proportion for the central incisors, lateral incisors. So accordingly, the length varies. So the width will start from I think seven point two to ten uh, for the central incisor, five point one or five point two to seven point five for lateral incisor. Like that, they have every point two millimeter difference. There, there are uh, seven uh, or eight sizes. I do not recall exactly. I read it. 25 years back, 1997, I read that, but I remember it was based on the width only, uh, and uh, uh, the length was not uh, length was as per the golden ratio proportion which we used to read in our vouchers. It was based on that length. Sir, yep. Uh, that brings us to the end of the question session, sir. So can we have a moderator's present a token of appreciation to our speakers? Uh, can you display for the first uh, presenter, Dr. Madhu, sir? Dr. Madhu, we are very happy to present you on behalf of ISPPT and the organizing team uh, this certificate of appreciation. Please thank accept, you. Dr. Madhu. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for everything. Entire ISPPT team. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you so much, sir. On behalf of ISPPD and the PDORAR, RARE, PDORAR 3 uh, organizing team, Dr. Shivani, I present you this certificate. Please. Thank accept. you so much. Sir. Thank you so much, sir. I'm so thank you to thank you. you. Thank you. Dr. Vivek, now it's your turn. Vivek, sir, please do the honors for Farid. Okay. Congratulations, Dr. Farin, for a wonderful presentation. Please accept the certificate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Dr. You Farin. To... Thank you.
thanks to all of ISPPD for organizing something so good and letting us all be a part of it. Thank you, Dr. Farin. Now it's time to thank our moderators. So can we request the speakers now to give it to the moderators? First for Vijay, sir. Uh, uh, many thanks to Vijay, sir. We learned a lot from him now, today. We always learn, sir. Worth it. Thank you. We always learn something new, sir. Yeah. Uh, we were lucky that Matru sir was our moderator. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It was an honor to have Dr. Vijay Matur as our moderator. Thank yes, you Dr. so much. And Dr. Vijay Rana, both Thank of you them. So yes. For the moderating so well. Yes. And thank you, Sharat, for the excellent yes. program. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vivek Rana, for being thank our you, moderator. Sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And thank Vivek, Dr. Sir. Geeta Priya also. Mm. Yeah, she's here, sir. Yes, very much here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Dr. Sharad. Thanks all to the speakers. Thank you, Vijay Mahathu, sir. And thanks, IPPD members all. Thank you very much. Before we close, we must appreciate Dr. Geeta, Dr. Sharad and their team for yes, being in time. Although we had a technical uh, problem yesterday, yes, but sir. now we are running in time yesterday, today, all, all sessions are running in time. Thank you very much for keeping the spirit of ISVPD and the spirit of pediatric dentistry to the higher level. Sharat, uh, we have lots of hopes from you uh, and keep it up. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sharat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much. And all the speakers. Thank you. Sir. Thank you sir. It's a good session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. That brings us to the end of the session four on day two. We'll meet you all tomorrow. We will be sending the link uh, as usual. The emails will be passed on. We'll see you tomorrow on session five of day three of Peter Virtual Peter Air 3.0. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir.